Hi everyone, today's video is taken from a recent IPSA seminar delivered by Steve and Pauline Richards on using creative writing to access the unconscious for self-development and clinical purposes. Both Steve and Pauline have significant experience with creative-based therapeutic techniques over their 40-year-long clinical careers, which has dovetailed with their work in the film industry. All of their creative work has been Jungian, but not the cliched pop Jungianism espoused by internet gurus and pop psychologists. They're building an international partnership at government level, which includes Hollywood directors, art directors, production designers, top-level games companies, universities, and a film school. Creativity is a human universal, and over this video, Steve and Pauline explain how one can use their own creative drives through the medium of script writing in order to authentically engage with the psyche. If you're interested in being in a seminar just like this one, then you might consider joining the next CADA of our IPSA students, launching in early 2022, where you'll be trained in techniques just like this one on your path to being accredited as a therapist in your territory. Check out the course webpage in the description below for more details. Let's get into it. In this context, it's a creative process that you can use with others. And that's really the reason um, I wanted to use it, because there's so much in here. It is so layered if we get into this, what you can achieve and how much of Jungian theory, in inverted commas, you can actually explore and pressure test through the act of creative writing. Now, whatever position we may take theoretically about that is almost irrelevant, perhaps even completely so when it comes to working with real people. Um, and the alternative to working like this is to do things like journaling, as you get it from certain online people, which is almost always in a CBT kind of frame. There's this, this specter of a, a CBT, a cognitive behavioral approach in the background of anything that's like that. Um, I, I think that kills creativity and encourages the wrong kind of, um, personal developments that's my view nobody has to accept that um, but on my own experience i would say that's absolutely true because um creative writing has a formulaic element to it once you get that you can be extremely free to express yourself within it there has to be a structure no matter what we do as I say that the cbt way of journaling daily and, and all of the kind of things they get to do even writing dreams it will run out there will come a point where that becomes so mechanistic that the psyche will disengage from that process you're simply translating into a written form a conscious ego reconstruction of an experience which is only partially remembered that's that's really important a conscious ego recollection of an experience which is only partially remembered Memory itself is constructive. So if we try to remember something, every time we do that, we're recreating, in effect, the memory. And we may apply things to it that weren't there or forget things that were there. So everything's been continually turned over. The advantage about creative writing like this is that it is a, a containing element which engages the psyche on an emotional and instinctive, and I'll use the term just for now, archetypal level, pretty much instantly. It's a, it's a real dialectic if you do it properly with the psyche, whereby the psyche will then speak through you. All the processes that you get in dreams, all the processes you get in myth are potentially available to you. The, the, the technical difficulties that most people feel exist don't exist. It's like, I can't write. You know. Well, once you've got a structure like that, which in effect tells you how to arrange the structure, 
once you've, you've, you've got that and you've engaged with it and see something coming to life, it's completely different than journaling or being back at school and asked to write some kind of English language or whatever language uh, essay or story. And the reason is this, that more even than a novel, which is another kind of creativity, writing a script with full emotional engagement means that you have to use all sorts of sensory modalities in it, of course, uh, but also in the moment because you're going to be experiencing your own emotional connection to what you're writing and the images and the narrative that unfolds from within. So it's a little like a Santre in the sense that there is a structure, but then there is great freedom. And you have to consider things like what's the lighting, what's the time of day, where are the cameras? What kind of shot oh, have we got here? Is it close? Is it tight on? Is it at a distance? What, what's happening? What are the relationships between the people in the frame of what you are creating on that inner screen? which could be like a dream or like, you know, um, a movie or anything like that that involves creativity. What can you see? What can you feel? If you don't feel, you won't produce something that's authentic, in my view, with respect to the psyche. There are formulaic writers, you know, they produce things like soap operas, which are very flat. And soap operas are like those kind of ruminant dreams that never really give you anything important. They're just turning over stuff in the background. Nothing good comes from a soap opera other than it keeps you engaged in a kind of a semi-neutral state. And it's like that with a lot of dreams. Jung talked about big dreams that for him were archetypal. Well, if you're going to write an archetypal screenplay, which is an inner form of active imagination when you create it, which has an external correlate. It's not just imagery. You're doing something and it's looking back at you and you're feeling a connection to it. The material that you feel in connection with externally and the material that you're working with on the inside are in harmonic resonance. Then you'll feel very powerful emotions and your consciousness in terms of its bandwidth, its capacity to feel for others as well as yourself will be augmented by that process. So if you have a patience and you can guide them in how to do this, so they get the confidence to talk through things in this way, they will find the psyche engages with them. It's a move on from uh, psychotherapy, where there's a relationship to somebody who talks back to you on an external level and there'll be some kind of inner resonance, which we, we, we know about, we've, we've, we've spoken about, between the personality, conscious and unconscious of the therapist and that of the patients. This, this is a, a full engagement with an individual on the inside. Characters will emerge, and these are, as we've discussed before, resultant images. And when you create a character, and is it us who creates it? That's, that's an argument to be had, I guess. It's a, it's a moot point. Or does the psyche create the character? And then we receive the character. The character has some autonomy, but is embedded within a timeline, is embedded within a narrative. Do we understand the character? Can we feel what the character feels? Does the character feel what we feel and reflects it back to us and acts it out to us? That's like a dream. The character might be the focus of a complex, literally a biopsychosocial complex that is, is turned into something that is relating not only to you through your affective connection, but to the narrative. That is a timeline. It's four dimensional. The character has a past. The character has relationships. The character has intentionality. Part of that intentionality is in the future. There is a completion that's built into that. There is teleology present. So powerful if you can engage with this. And if you can encourage people gently to engage with it, you can really move on. And also, if you're working with someone who is creative, perhaps in another medium, maybe they're a musician, for example, or an artist, then you could ask them to acquire this, the skill of writing in this way and then producing music or artwork or both that reflects it again. And then this hologram, which was your original engagement, exponentially grows in terms of the connections that can be made emotionally and in terms of understanding the individuation process, how that unfolds. Some of the characters in the narrative will fail. They're flawed. And the youngins will say, well, there's the shadow, there's the hero, there's the whatever. 
yeah, 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 maybe. But you have to feel it to know what's going on. And when you engage with that affect in a Panksepian Mark Solms sense, and finally in a Jungian sense of, of the transcendent connection that comes through engaging with that emotion, the whole thing will work authentically. And you'll know that because it will affect other people. So in that sense, it is, in my view, an excellent form of personal development and, it, and you can support people in, in developing that skill and expressing themselves. The things that get in the way principally, like with any creative medium, is that I can't do that. I have never done that. Anyone who's ever had a dream, anyone who's ever watched a television programme, read a book, had a fantasy, had a reverie, anyone who's done any of those, and that's all of us, can do it. It's a case of a very simple structure that allows you to engage. And there are descending levels of that on the surface. The surface structure is, what's the angle of the shot? What's the lighting? What's the time of day? What can we see? What's happening? That's the surface structure. And that's the tapestry that's forming in front of us. And gradually we get woven into that, but not completely because we still stand away from it. We are participants, observers in the narrative. That is active imagination par excellence. Because something comes from it. It's not like you have a fantasy, like a lot of youngins do, and they get lost in it. And they imagine they see Achilles or whoever it might be, or Thor or, or whatever in there, with no real engagement other than inflation. This gives you feedback. And the way to do it is to treat it like active imagination. So I have no idea where this is going to go. I'll let the story tell itself. And when you make that decision, you're signaling to the unconscious that you are available to act as the medium of expression of that which needs to work itself through. Before you know it, you have everything done. The narrative is there. And at the end of that, take a step back, look at it, and you might say it's full of archetypes. And yeah, it will be what pass for archetypes. But if you analyze them properly, what you're going to see is that they themselves are embedded in something which has nothing to do with any of them individually. A narrative is the, the affective and teleological matrix. It's affective and teleological. And also embedded within that is the genome as well because of the teleological elements and the instincts because of the affect. You see the truth of the psyche in a narrative like that, that you don't get when you, 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 you know, read, um, I'm going to have to say this and forgive me, something by some of these youngins, um, when they write on Greek mythology or whatever, because they're not really engaging with it, they're not creative, they're interpreting something without engagement. If you do this and you engage with it and interpret it, you can then do something similar with someone else, somebody else, with their dreams, with their active imagination, with their fantasies, with their life. So the minute we start to overlay too many constructs on that, we become separate from feeling. I describe it as method writing. But it's not where, as with a method actor, you take on one role and you live it and you become it and then act it. You experience everything, every single character. You should feel that. You should have the perspective of those characters. Then you understand the narrative and you'll understand something that, that is often called fate, for example, that some people are required to act things out in their life that appears from the individual perspective to have no you know, rationality to it at all. But they do things because they are part of the narrative of life and that taken together, every social and cultural interaction we have is affecting us, as is our biology, as is our ancestry. Everything, it's all acting together and we play a role within that. How conscious are we of that? All the world is a stage, all the people are players as uh, Shakespeare puts it. And in that sense, if, if you can create a narrative like this, you can occupy several different perspectives within a situation on an affective level and understand archetypally the motivation for evil, the motivation for love, the motivation for self-sacrifice, motivation for self-interest. And then the reversal of, of these things not just into their opposite, but into gradations of opposites along the bandwidth of spectrum dynamically as the narrative unfolds. 
so the characters are not fixed and not flat they grow they develop and life is a shared journey one of the things that neurotic people and we all have been and still am to some extent neurotic do is that they reduce their perceptions of others to to their own interest and their own view the horizon of their life shrinks they decontextualize themselves by focusing too much on the split on their polarity within some well-meaning therapist tries to get them to, to think about other people, other social interest, if that's wrongly applied, can dissolve you of your integrity. Uh, Rogerian humanistic person-centered therapy can advise you to give unconditional positive regard to everyone. Again, this is contraindicated, you know, for your own mental health. But through a narrative, you can struggle with that. You can struggle with it. You can see other characters struggling with it. You can see them struggling with their own capacity to do evil and then the justifications that they may develop for why they are that way for the greater good the complexity of life unfolds through a, a strong narrative and as you as you read it or write it or watch it and it unfolds that mirrors real life because we meet people we don't know them we make assumptions projections and transferences all of that happens within a good narrative and it's worked through and it's worked out. This, this is why personally, I think it's an excellent form of personal development. And I, I could go on, I won't, I best stop there and uh, see if there's any questions or, or feedback before we go further. Can I jump in super quickly with that then? So is the, is the plan, I, I don't wanna go down the wrong avenue, but it would be interesting to know how one would start with that. I say that because when you say, um, imagine like the camera angle the lighting the time of day etc i imagine what you're describing isn't a conscious process necessarily or at the very least it's only partly conscious yeah. it's not it's not because that's where a lot of resistance i imagine could come from as well it's like well i don't know where the camera should be i don't know what the time of day is ah but if one lets something flow through them yeah so so how would one get started or if we were to encourage a patient how would how would they get started well, you give them, and we can go through it, the, the initial structure of how to lay something out, but the, the baseline, which you don't always follow, is you have to see the screen, you have to see the frame. The only thing that you see in a movie or in a television drama is what's in the frame. And that frame is close on, it's pulled back, it's panning, it's tracking, it's wherever it is, but that is all you can see until there's a change, the scene changes, there's a flash cut, there's a you know, match dissolve or whatever the term may be that moves you out of that frame. That's all you can see. And it's like a dream. But when a movie starts, it starts like a dream starts. It's like it's there and you're fully there. It's as if you've had a life that's led up to that moment. And what you do when you watch a movie is become like the dream. I go, you're embedded in the movie and you want the information to come to you that gives context for why you're there. That keeps you engaged with it if you watch a film if you're writing it though it's different if you're writing it in, the, in this method writing way that you know there is a context and you can feel it you can you can feel it wanting to take advantage of the situation when you when you start to write the scene and you start to follow the structure which we can go through in a minute don't think i have to get the structure in place what you have to get is the initial shot whatever that is and then you can change it the first opening line uh, instruction, if you like, which will be on the left is open to, in other words, it opens to something. That's what you see. And then you get a description of what you can see, or it may only be of a character. It might be open to close arm, and then the name of the character. And then there's some dialogue or there's an expression and the dialogue is paced. Things like beats, so somebody says something and then there's a beat, there's a pause. It might be a double beat like that. And then you time that with yourself. And as you do, you're modeling the character as a real person. And that sounds like reification, and it is, but it's not reification in a way that I would normally criticize. Hopefully that will be obvious, the difference. Um, you, you get that. And then what is the character doing? Is there anyone else in the room? Are they remembering something themselves? What does the shot tell you about their eyes, their emotion? The amount of information in a shot is huge. 
and it moves on from that. So I hope you can see how you would get very, very quickly into your unconscious doing this whilst remaining conscious. That's unusual. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excited to get going. Yeah, thanks. Oh, Jamie. Is that Jamie is as well? Yeah, Jamie. Yes, very much so. Um, hi, guys. Um, I was hi. just had a quick question off the back of what you just said, um, how it, it's a very quick way to get into the unconscious. Is that because of the amount of like the bandwidth of information present? Is that why is the reason why that happens so effectively? Yes, it, it's, it's not um, or shouldn't be um, an overload because it's, it's like with a dream, as I say, for some reason, when, when we're there and it's an instant, in an instant, you are in context. Mm. That's as if you've been written in by something, which is why I always use the idea of there's, there's a screenwriter for a dream, there's a producer, mm. which ultimately will be the genome and self-regulation. There's a director as well. There's somebody who is saying, do this and don't do that. Mm. In a minute, there'll be a scene change and everything has been timed and regulated. Uh, and that then contains the amount of information that you need to mm. respond to. It's like that in a film. You're meant to see things. Mm. Sometimes you're meant not to see them, but find the relevance for them later on. It's like that in a dream series. A dream series evolves. But yes, there's a large amount of information, but it's all meaningful. That's the key. All of it will be meaningful, even if when we're writing creatively, we don't know what that meaning is. It's to trust oh, it. It's okay. to trust the process. Mm. So in other words, the author appears to be the person who's on the tippy tappy and is typing everything out, but it's actually something else. Mm. Provide the opportunity for that creativity to come through. And that's very different from mechanistic uh, journaling, for example, which can just be ego fictions. This is fiction, but it's different. This is fiction that's creative. It's coming from the unconscious. So what, what I would recommend, as I say, if you do this for yourself, it, it is to engage in that, and then you'll find other things start to really come through. You'll probably, and I recommend that you do actually actively hope that this happens or go searching for it. You'll get the image to create a character guide and a background for the narrative. So as a character emerges, you may know nothing about him at first or her, and then suddenly their whole backstory is there. Like, whoa, who produced that? Well, I, I didn't. It just emerged. But then the qualities of that person, their height, their weight, their age, their, their build, how they dress, if it's in the contemporary period, do they drive? If they do, what kind of car? Where do they live? Do they have children? Are they in a relationship? You build all of that up, and suddenly the psyche give you more, give you more, give you more. And it will resonate with you. So, as I say, in terms of practical psychotherapy, if, if you can help somebody to be creative like that, what you're doing is strengthening their ego in this way. You're saying, this isn't you, this is your unconscious. Immediately there's a separation. It's not saying, this is you, inflate, this is, this is, or, or be afraid. It's saying, this is something that you are working on as a result of that creative drive coming from within. And so much will come out from that. And someone might say, I, something terrible happened to me as a child. I'm going to write a story about it, or I feel I should. That's a surface structure cognitive rationalization for the kind of pressure they're feeling about what to write about. And then they'll write something which will include what they thought they were going to write about, but it will include so many other things. And in there, you'll see the homeostatic, the healing process coming through, maybe the help that they should have had and didn't get all sorts of things will start to articulate the way through and then they can be helped to see that as being like a dream or a dream series that's meaningful and emotional for them and then you can say how about a sequel have you thought about that and like, oh yeah yeah this person got through didn't they yeah what happened then what will happen you know and you're moving on you're moving them on you're engaging with them and you're giving them a gift the gift of accessing creativity and also, as I say, affect emotion that they may have had difficulty with.
if that makes sense, Jamie. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. You could start anywhere with it, creatively. Anything is a trigger, a piece of music, anything, or just pick up a book and open it at random. Mm. Uh, bang. Because you prepare yourself to say, when, when the unconscious is ready, it will light something up in the environment. And then uh, I dive in and we see where it goes. Yeah, because I think we might have been talking about this on one of the previous Carter roundtables, where like I've definitely noticed where when I do creative writing, it will be sparked by something and the character and the story will kind of get somewhere and then it will just fall off. And it's like, you kind of need to finish this to get some resolution. But there's no, it's very hard to get back into the affect of the original affect that prompted the, the narrative. Yeah. Um, and I don't know whether that means that that, if you were to go back and analyze what the narrative was about, that means that you've resolved it in some way in your life or whether there's, resistance towards completing the narrative because it would resolve that thing yeah it, um, really good questions and, and they could be answered technically i think practically the, there is a different way which includes all of the considerations theoretical ones but is not distracted by those that's one of my as you know my criticisms of the youngins is that they talk endlessly but do nothing even about creativity so with that, if you feel that you've hit a, a roadblock, so to speak, there is something about the character that you've been focusing on that needs to be complemented in some way. Mm. There's an incomplete um, ecology. And you can say from that, well, all that means is that I've been told by the fact that my libido is withdrawn from the creative act that I am missing something that is really obvious. Mm. Now, if you hold that in mind and relax and accept it right down to the, the lower part of your abdomen, right down that deep, you'll probably find that something will emerge instantly to, to compensate because you're saying, I'm open to being redirected. I'm not trying to, to force the narrative on the character, which you, you, know, you may or may not be identifying with to whatever extent. But we're not isolated psychosocially. We require relationships to adjust our life has meaning in a context. So that's what I would say is that, yeah, that there are theoretical reasons, but they will distract. The practical engagement pretty much is the same as, as with any creative media you might use therapeutically. Eventually, you, you'll get that happening. You know, you can engage your dreams, and it's wonderful, and suddenly they're gone. You can do Chevreau's pendulum, and it's wagging away, and it stops. That's the psyche telling you a slight adjustment needs to be made to what you've already gained. That is enough very often, I would say usually, for the compensation to emerge because you've acknowledged that you're pushing too hard and the compensation is saying, just go that way a little. Mm. Uh, and you usually find something will break through. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that, that's exactly what it feels like, like you're forcing it. Yeah, so that, yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So if we force something... Um, thank you, uh, Jamie. If we force something in therapy, we would we would stop ourselves. If we were working with a patient and we felt we were forcing something, we would stop. We'd stop doing that. It's no different. It's the same dynamic. So the unconscious has limited ways of telling us we're doing the wrong thing. It doesn't talk to us unless we engage with it in this way. And that's a really good point. I'd like everyone to remember this, that... The unconscious produces dreams in narrative form. Culturally, these are projected into myths and cultural narratives in, in the media that we, we've always experienced right back through history. That is preferred way of communicating as we normally do psychosocially, in other words, talking to another human being. If, however, if the adjustment is so fine, it's in the ego position, we won't move on from that by talking or attempting to talk to the inner world as if it were the outer world. That would be an abstraction of the grand narrative, which is myth or even a dream. So what we have to do is to accept the fact that we've been given a hint in the only way that it knows how, other than making a deal or causing frustration. And there'll, there'll be a number of uh, prodromal attempts at redirecting us before that happens 
the best one is that we dry off because that's like saying i've withdrawn the libido because doing the wrong thing i want you to do something else and the expectation is that you ask it in the right way what that should be but if you keep forcing it it'll just keep pulling away because it's saying homeostatically you're not listening or we're not listening so i'll, I'll withdraw i'll withdraw keep pushing i'm just going to withdraw and what will happen is you'll feel depressed and flat. That's because of the withdrawal of libido. So what you should do is say, well, what do I need to do? How do I need to approach my unconscious to allow it to compensate again homeostatically and for that energy to be given back? Merely the suggestion that you are open to receiving that is often enough for that to change direction again. Now, another thing that people do is that they try and do a night's move in the wrong way when dealing with the regulatory process of the psyche as a whole and start to say well uh, how about this i've got this collective fantasy i want to write about i want to uh, take the idea of a superhero or sci-fi or whatever and introduce that and the unconscious might just say no i'm not going to let you do that that's not what i meant and you'll get a reasonable distance doing that but it will turn into a soap opera kind of process there'll be a lack of affective engagement and it will flatline out. You would have put a lot of your available energy into the ego fantasy of the sci-fi interject or wherever it might be, but not actually be creative. So that's another level, uh, if you like, another way that the unconscious lets us know that we're not doing the right thing. So just like with the mannered approach, whether we're using Chevro's pendulum or anything else, if we approach in a mannered way, we'll get the signal back that we need. So that, that's really, really important. Then when we approach it properly, the grand narratives will emerge again. It's like when the dreams start again, when we've been overanalyzing somebody's dreams or our own, they dry up. Well, do something different, ask in the right way, and suddenly they're there again. And you've had your signal, but have we understood it? Or do we expect some little wise old man sitting in the right cerebral hemisphere to have this external Socratic dialogue with us? No, it doesn't work that way, does it that way? And it provides big stories, big narratives. That's why we're all fascinated, all of us, with movies, with books, with video games, with myths. That's why we invest our energy in that, because what is within is also without. What is psychosocial reflects biology, but not in the sense that the ego would or should mistake psychosocial for biology. It's represented by projection from within to without. So it's the same thing, but appears different. What's the connection through the ego? Affect. You hit the emotion, you get down into instinct. And then what the Jungians call archetypes are embedded immediately into their proper context and can be understood. So uh, I'm sorry if that was an over explanation. No, that was great. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Nick everybody Hi, Nick. um first of all uh, we're 40 minutes in and this is this is already amazing like <laughs> like so you're like i can just feel the energy coming from me Stephen. uh it resonates so much um no i was i was gonna say the the comment you made on kind of the technical structures being this being a part of the reason why most people don't do this or get into it it, it, it it's a very real thing yeah. um I once had a young analyst tell me, you know, because she she was saying that a lot of people come to her and say that they they view their lives like a movie, and she she said, well, sometimes I tell them, you know, well, who's writing it? And in that moment, two things came for me. It was just okay. I don't need you to interpret my dreams anymore, and that was absolutely right because I I, I thought that it, it really was kind of. It, it, it opened up a lot for me in terms of, well, who is writing my story? And, and you said, is there a sequel? Um, in terms of at this point, so if, if we did have an individual who we wanted to introduce this kind of, kind of creative medium to, um, assuming you said earlier that this would be something to transition outside of therapy, is that correct? So there is already some level of an understanding of what rapport with the unconscious would look like for that individual in terms of course correction, if that, if that were necessary. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Um, 
again, the, the, the best stories are ones which complete. If they don't complete, then there's the implication they have to be added to. Uh, if someone is in distress or is trying to solve themselves, that's not good. That's not a good outcome because they've been guided through something, through projection into a scenario, say a myth uh, or the representation of a myth, and it just stops. That is a neurotic position to experience because it's like, what now? Because I put everything into following the story and it's not complete. It, and this is the soap opera trap. Whereas the best myths do complete or they complete enough for a person to understand that's the journey up to that point. And there's enough in there for me to understand. And then the Jungians, the, the over, overly technical eyes, this is a horrible sort of neologism, that they, 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 they overly do that. Uh, and then abstract things out and say, well, there's the hero cycle. What's that? Oh, well, Joseph Campbell defined the hero cycle. Did he indeed? Uh, in what sense? Did he? Yeah, he said he, he acted as if he could feel. <clears throat> But could he help you to feel other than just simply describe it as he thinks it's felt for other people or, or why it's acted out in that way? So I always pull back from uh, those kind of people. And I know that he advised the guys on Star Wars and he advised them in a way which is, you know, commensurate with Jung. I appreciate all of that. But if we're talking about individual personal development or psychotherapy, that's got to be a, a much more personal but hands-off uh, way of guiding somebody. So the role should be to, to give them the means, help them and back off. And, and that is the archetypal role of a psychopomp, which is my own belief about the way that depth psychology should go. If you go to the deepest levels, your role is to be a psychopomp, not to be he or she who contains, who rules, who governs, and constraints and controls another person's life. You, you go in and you go out. Like that's your role. And the best psychopomps and stories do that. They're in the background usually, and they give a little bit of advice, and they're a little bit mysterious. They're in, they're out, and the victory is the, the, the character, uh, whoever is being guided by that psychopomp. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a massively important uh, medium. Sorry if I, I've wandered off track here. I may have done. No, that was great. Thank you. With my own creative writing stuff, it took a long time before anything would come out, so to speak. Um, and that's because I tried to force things like backgrounds and to try and understand the plot and where the plot was going before actually doing things. So when you advised a moment ago to, you know, could you do a character guide? Could you do a background stuff or to ask patients to, to do that? How important is that part for the overall, say, writing or even healing process? Or is that going to come later? And the main story It'll probably come later the, the, the main thing and thank you for that james the, the main thing is to provide the medium for the expression and the openness is part of that medium the openness to say i'm, I'm ready to do this i'm ready to set myself to one side and let it come through and i'll know you can say in effect you're unconscious because i will feel and i'll feel what you want me to feel and I'll understand what you want me to understand as this unfolds within its context, which again is, that's the important thing, a really important thing I want to get across. The psyche tells you in its own way what it wants you to understand. It doesn't appreciate having that put back in. So if we write in a formulaic way, if you think about it, that's internal projection again. So the, the, the ability to be open to that which is pressing that's really powerful. That's like taking lucid dreaming and active imagination and hypnosis and adding them all together. And most Jungians are just theoreticians. They don't do, they just talk about this. Everything's an idea to them. I, I think Jung would have been a brilliant novelist. And in a, in a way, he did. He did. He right. He, yeah, he, he was. I mean, Ion is Ion's pretty entertaining. Yeah. It's not. It's not real, but it's entertaining. Yeah, Memory Streams Reflections is a work of fiction. He said it was on the first page. And his red books and his black books are creative works of fiction mm -hmm. to do with his own personal myth. This is a way of finding your personal myth. 
I was going to ask something along the lines of um, how, where does like re-editing and editing come into this process? Oh, that's fine. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and so long as you, you, you take that as being a Socratic dialectic, in other words, you feel it should happen and you've been guided to do it. The pace of your ability to, to write will just go like that. Mm -hmm. And you, you'll, you'll go into a, a creative trance state of engagement with yourself because the unconscious is working harmoniously with you. Everything that you do will then be received and everything it does will then be received by you. That's as good as it gets. Yeah. Okay. Because I imagine like if you were translating sort of fiction to a screenplay, for example, yeah. that would be quite a technical process. So how is there a method in which you'd be balancing the technical side of things with the keeping the original affect? Um, yeah. What I would do there is see them as different although they're produced in a similar way because um, pretty much all of my, my screenplays were originally novels and that was that was just the way I, I did it uh, up to a point and then they stopped I didn't need to do the novels anymore uh, and I'm now able to understand that process enough to communicate it to people mm -hmm. the only reason I do a novel first now is for copyright because I'm working with people who would steal this mm. so it has to be copyrighted and the best way to do that is to publish it on Amazon, self-publish it, but with an ISBN number, which just, that's it. You've got it. It's nailed. It's out in the public. It's got your name on it's got an ISBN international standard book number and you've nailed your copyright. But then usually when we go to the, the script level, it's a different experience. It's like, there's the prompt. What do I do with this? You've given me this before. Is this right? And then it just goes like that. And settles and it's on its own trajectory so again you trust it and relate to it okay thanks so uh, i think the way to look at this is you, you'll, you'll see how it's laid out in in a way which uh, is acceptable to producers directors and actors so it's, if this has been tried and uh, tested so you need a synopsis obviously a summary which is that comes at the end usually, obviously, because you, you've actually done your work. Although you may find you're just under this creative spurt within and you just do it, you just write it. So you, you go with whatever happens. You trust the psyche. It will then trust you and the creativity will be given to you. So we start with that um, and then make it potentially interesting enough that people want to read the rest of it. And I think we've got about four or five scenes there's one from the past, which is toned down. It's actually the end of Victrix One, but with a lot taken out of it. But the, the idea is in there that it has come from those times. Again, you'll see things which Jungians would recognize as archetypes. You can accept it as that, but I, I would really say, look for the instincts. The instincts motivate archetypes. They have no meaning without instincts. It's usually, I have a need, I want something, I must do something. There's the drive to act in the world. The instinct anticipates completion. The archetype is the form of it that the actor takes within the narrative. But the narrative itself is an archetype because they're so embedded, they are without meaning if you take either the background away or the figure away. So they are essential and they are co-present. So what appear to be archetypes, the expression of instinct, the expression of the teleology of the genome of the characters. If, uh, if that makes sense. You yeah, know, that makes perfect sense. It also explains, I think, why um, it's like the basis for the whole like conflict thing in narrative writing, I think. Um, as in it's like conflict, personal conflict, social conflict, conflict against the world. That's like yeah. a, I think a fr famous like framework. Yeah. Um, and I think instinct explains all of those much better than that model. It, it, it does. There was um, an excellent series on um, was it Amazon Prime, The Man in the High Castle, which was from uh, an original novel, a very famous uh, <laughs> American writer, um, Dick, unfortunately, was his surname. <laughs> has an unfortunate connotation in England, it probably does in America as well. But uh, the first two, I think, of the three seasons of that were wonderful. It was so creative. The television version or, or the the amazon stream version and then they brought 
contemporary politics in to the end and it destroyed it. So again, you can see how the, the individual character or the collective character can come through and you see the power drive mm -hmm. and behind the power drive of, of these people, you could see their instincts. So even they couldn't escape it, although they destroyed the narrative in our view anyway, personally, uh, they did it in a specific way that was itself still instinctive. So yeah, you, you, you can never escape them. They're always there. Even when politics comes in, it, it, it's Adlerian pathology came in very, very clearly. When I'm, when I'm doing creative writing stuff, oftentimes there'll be a particular scene I'm motivated by. And I say, that's, that's fine. Let's not start at the beginning and go through this one. We're going to do this one today. Then the next day it'll be, okay, we'll do this one. And then we'll do this one. And then I'll go back and I'll look over it and be like, they, they fit about 90%. There's about 10% that doesn't, there's small details, you know, that don't quite necessarily match up. You know, how did this person get this object when it was over there at this point and stuff like that. So it's off the back of Jamie's editing question. And I, I'm not entirely sure how to formulate it, but it's something like, it's as if the psyches attempt to work through, say myself, or if this is universal, is not perfect. It's not perfect. It will get something out and then looking back on it later, it's almost like it will allow the initial burst of creativity to be altered. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering what that means, that, that editing process in general. How could it not flow perfectly first time round, if you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, again, I think um, look at it within the context of that psychology as a whole, that the, what you were referring mm -hmm. to as being editing is a process of becoming conscious of something and then trying to assimilate that into an ego position. Editing of uh, a script for me is that it's like, is my ego position right? If it's not, then I'll write shit. You know, it, it, will, be, it will be real shit because I won't be connected to my unconscious. Or if I'm too connected to my unconscious, but there's not sufficient ego in it, likewise, it will be a pile of shit. And then it's a, this Socratic dialogue exchange of energy and information between these two very different kinds of mind, and they are very different. And then the resultant effect, effect, not effect, the effect is the final edited screenplay. When you get that feeling, it's done. The same way as I've seen Pauling work with her artwork, it's done. Not one more pencil, pixel, nothing. Yeah. It's done. Nothing more. And the certainty comes from within. So I would say that the editing process is an act of cognitive engagement and then physical, mechanical, and eventually emotional engagement, which is being required on you or of you to do from within in order to make this a truly creative process. Right. So the ego does, as with everything, the ego's role is kind of central to it. Even if the material is coming from the unconscious, it can't happen without the ego. No, it, it would lack a lot of structure and, and you would get the... The kind of things you often get with dreams where the symbol is the most important thing and, and that's what you see in abstract art you do. Mm -hmm. and you see people engaging with a symbol yeah. and then unpacking that emotionally yeah but technically it's it's crap yeah but but they're engaging with this you know line of dripping paint which is dried onto a blank canvas or something like that and that means something to them because they're engaging with the symbol but there is no true narrative there there is, there is just a rather egocentric, almost narcissistic engagement with a symbol which is very private uh, and therefore inflationary. So I would argue that a lot of abstract art is inflationary. It doesn't act in the world. No. So, um, yeah, that, that would, uh, I hope, put that in context for you, that it is necessary that the ego adapts to the world. The unconscious expects that. The, the psyche is set up to anticipate an ego that is uh, adapted. It's like, that's your job. My job is look after me on the inside. That's what the unconscious will do. Reluctantly, it will enter a dialogue. But if the unconscious enters a dialogue with the, with the ego, the ego is not engaged with the world. It will only do that actively when someone is maladjusted or maladapted in some way. And creativity mm. is a form of maladaptation which is ne nevertheless seeking its own positive application in the world, whether that's art or whether it's technology, whatever the, the general categories of creativity are, ultimately should be engagement with the world. 
So there's a timeout where there's communication. The unconscious is trying to compensate for the ego position and get it to act in the world. And the more potential a person has latently within them, the higher the potential they have. In other words, the more the instincts will push to release the genome's potential. And so therefore, the more out of kilter and necessarily neurotic we are as a starting point. There are higher potential people are always neurotic. You can make this daily observation. They're never content and happy. Simple people with a low ceiling adapt very well. And they're not neurotic. The unconscious doesn't bother them. They watch soap operas. That's awful, you know, to say that, but they do. They watch soap operas because mm -hmm. that's their ceiling. The ordinary mundane background waveform of adaptation is sufficient. What goes wrong for a lot of young people now is that their instincts are being ducted off into non-productive fantasy representations of instincts, which they think are archetypes. And they become ego fictions and internal projections and they're trapped. So they're living a virtual existence, a provisional life, as Jung would have called it. And the pressure is still on them because it's not being relieved, except temporarily through the displacements of, of say, uh, science fiction or wherever it might be. It, it doesn't complete enough. They're still neurotic with respect to their potential or they're teased. You could be the next you know, emperor of the galaxy or the universe or whatever it might be. That's inflationary and they know it, they can't achieve it. So they need another fix. That wears off, I have another fix. Whereas a, a true myth would say, this is what not to do, as Jung put it, very wisely I think, this is what not to do and that's what you should do. And then the end will be understandable. Even if it's less than agreeable or optimal, you would have had a lived life. Like many of the Greek heroes fail. And the Jungians say, yeah, that's because he's imperfect, because he's got a shadow. Well, no, in real life, people who have very high quality of character often fail because it's a Darwinian world. But the best we can do sometimes is to live authentically by our nature, succeed or otherwise. The important thing is the effort that we put in. Thank you, Steve. That makes a lot of sense. I'm thinking now on the on what characters really are because it's good you've sparked a thought there when people go back for say their next fix of a marvel movie or the 27,000th installment in the harry potter universe it's not so much it's, it sounds like it's the characters that people are getting attached to rather than what the characters are doing so if you can take say iron man and put him in any context and people will still go to see iron man there's something about that character that's resonating with people but i, I know with myself i've i've lived if you like with the same cast of characters when I was about 14 and there were initial plot points that came up when I was 14 now when I'm putting things onto the page the plot points are changing and, it, and it, it's annoying because it's like I thought the story was like this but it's not now that I'm older it seems and I've learned more and experienced more they'll be in a different context so the stories are changing but the characters are the same so I guess my question is what is a character it's obviously not an archetype you know, that we can just, just point at and go, oh, yes, that's the wise old man. doesn't make any sense. Good question. What is a character? I, I could, I could uh, ask you to answer that, but, uh, but as you've asked me first, <laughs> <laughs> a character is something that we relate to, and we relate to the characters psychodynamically. So that means the fundamental psychodynamics are going to be there. So transference, projection, interjection, identification. And what that tells us immediately is that we don't understand the character because we're projecting our unconscious onto them. What is our unconscious? Well, I would say it's not archetypal. It's again, instinctive and it's genomically teleological. So that which we project onto uh, characters, which are called archetypes by Jungians or collective representations as they were understood in anthropology before Jung, is, is all about engaging with the process of uncovering the meaning of the process of simply being alive and living out our journey. So what they are is our representations. We call them resultant images, Pauline and I, as, as you know. So the effects of culture, the anticipations of the genome and a resultant uh, image set within a narrative, which is a myth or a collective story, 
that gives us an indication of how things can turn out. And if we engage with that, we learn to anticipate the future consciously, which means we augment our instincts and we can therefore adjust instinctive pressure according to our understanding of how things should turn out. And characters are examples. They can be exemplars or they can be bad examples, but they are nevertheless that. And good characters are not flat because that suggests people can't change. In the, in the Lilith trilogy, and it is a trilogy, it's not a single work, may as well give this away, the Von Hess character completely changes. He, he doesn't turn into his opposite. He distills more of who he is. He doesn't become a white character as opposed to a, a black natured character. He evolves and he develops, and so does Lilith. Lilith achieves something which was offered to her at the beginning that she failed to understand and that caused a cascade of the rest of the rest of the stories so if they if she just stayed the same that would be a complete failure in writing and it would be a failure as a myth she had to change and so does von hess if he's just the dark guy that doesn't work it, it's just a caricature rather than a character it's a stereotype of the collective consciousness not an archetype so-called of the collective unconscious but even then they have to change otherwise we have no exemplar we have no way of saying <clears throat> i've been one-sided as young would put it i need to change and the young and say well look at your shadow and look at your anima oh for god's sake no just live just live and engage <clears throat> these things will emerge so the character is 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 that which is not understood within a context that is not understood, but we are attached to in an effort to understand and then reinterpret our developing relationship to them in uh, measurement against our ego position and against our biological and teleological potential. We test this out. I'm with you. I'm with you. You've, you've sparked another thought there off about children's literature and how one could as an adult genuinely produce children's literature. I mean, something that's considered to be really good, like say The Wind in the Willows or Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, as opposed to say just some TV program that happens to be on, you know, like a child's TV station or whatever. As, as an adult, how can someone produce children's literature in that instance then, you know? You need an affective connection to previous states of your own personal developments. Right. And once once you access that you you and I, this is why we say don't do it in psychotherapy but if you're talking about being creative that's different mm -hmm. the, the, if you can go back to a, a former ego state what you will actually acquire are the limitations but also the enrichment or the enrichment of the perception of the world that a child has which is in effect magical because they don't understand the world and there, there are things out there which, which are forces that they cannot understand unless they relate to them. And you see in, in their prototypical form, those things which are understood better through an adult myth later on, but they're forming then. And uh, in terms of Jungian typology, with all of its limitations, most children, most are very sensually orientated to the world. They're going through the senses intuition might be present as, as an abstracted Jungian um, type configuration but it's usually latent it's lagging behind the sensory experience of being a child where things like color are really really important for probable biological reasons like those red berries are poisonous and that green leaf there might be able to heal you if you get stung by a nettle or something like that so the impression of color and of light and the perception of distance and then the kinesthetic feeling of attachment, which is important for survival. They're all very, very prominent in a child. Then later things start to distill out. Uh, and it might be that the sensory process pressing is still present and still dominant in the child. Maybe it's connected to emotion, feeling in that subjective, introverted feeling way that Jungians go on about, perhaps. But even that becomes more rational, more adult as they grow. Uh, typically, and Jung said this, this, his thinking type is present, is latent, but it develops in intensity. The same with intuition. 
So the way anyway to, that I would say to, to write authentically uh, is to have an emotional engagement with what it's like to be a child and sensory based experience. You lower the, the clutter of, uh, say, introverted thinking and its analytical way of dividing things into polarities tends to go. It's the experience of the moment which is felt. And then the connectedness to others and the sense of there's a, a strange place here. It might be like Alice in Wonderland or, or through the looking glass. You've been taken into a weave of impressions and relationships that aren't properly understood. The rules are a bit broken or a bit bendy. And that's what it's like to be a child when you're trying to understand the world. We don't know what the rules are. We rely on people. And children's stories are like that. We rely on somebody and they turn out to be a wicked witch. Somebody's deceiving us. And then immediately you're in the instincts, which are underneath everything. And beneath that is the genome, which is trying to prepare you by anticipation.